Today we'll talk about limits of functions, approach and destination. Now what does that mean? The idea of a limit, as we'll see in this unit, is an idea that's associated with calculus, which is the mathematics of change in motion. And it's an idea that is very useful in this context, and we'll introduce it that way. It's one that you might not have seen before, but I think you have intuitive ideas for it, as you'll see. So, let's first look at limits of functions and intuitive beginning. And the very first idea we'll talk about is a new tool, the limit. So, to introduce this, we'll begin with a very familiar example. An example you might have encountered in a physics class or another mathematics class. We'll talk about the idea of an average velocity. Now, as you may know, the average velocity, something you can compute if you take a trip in a car, for example, is simply the distance traveled over the time elapsed. So I'll write distance traveled and time elapsed. Now, how do we actually calculate that? Well, the distance traveled would be calculated in a very simple fashion as the distance to the final point subtract away the distance from the initial point. And for the time, the same sort of thing. The final time will subtract away from that the initial time. So if we were to put this all into symbols, which is what we want to do in mathematics after all, perhaps we can abbreviate average velocity as V sub AV. So the little AV will indicate average velocity. And then we could indicate maybe the distance that we have reached as S1. And the distance we began with is S sub 0, or S naught, as it's often pronounced. And we'll do the same thing for time, T1 being our final time, and T naught, or T0, being our initial time. Now, if you just look at this as an algebraic object, you can see that algebra requires something we take note of here. Algebra requires that this denominator not be 0 if this is going to make any sense. So this notation, by the way, has an alternate. And let me go ahead and write that here so we can begin to introduce it. Sometimes people will write what looks like a little triangle S and a little triangle T. Now that's read delta S. That's the capital Greek D for delta. Delta S or delta T. But in fact, the way people actually say is that this is the change in S where S here will represent distance. And this will be the change in T, where T represents time. But to get back to the question here of the denominator, the algebra requires that delta T, which is T1 minus T0, not be 0. That's a fundamental issue when you talk about this notion which of average velocity. So we want to keep that in mind as we ask the following question. How? Could we find the velocity, and I don't mean the average velocity now, but the velocity at the single instant, single instant of time, say, we'll go ahead and look at t sub 0. Now, how, what would that correspond to in your experience? Well, if you've ever driven in a car, there's a speedometer. And the speedometer tells you the speed you are going at a given instant. That is exactly analogous to the velocity here at a single instant. How would we actually calculate that? Unfortunately, we cannot use the average velocity formula because at a single instant, there's only a single time. And because there's only a single time, the denominator is going to be 0 if we try to subtract that time from itself. So that poses a fundamental problem. How do we find the velocity, which we know exists because of our experience, at a single instant? So the algebra of the average velocity doesn't help. So we have to face the question, how do we deal with this? So what we do is we use our imagination. We imagine the following. We imagine that we let, and I'll do it in this direction, because that's how we'll do it when we graph it, we'll let t1, the later time, approach the earlier time. So we'll take the average velocity over this time interval, but we'll let the time interval get shorter and shorter and shorter. Now that doesn't violate the algebra because there's still a distance here, and so the denominator will not be 0. 
but it does tend to move us toward our ideal of finding the velocity at this one instant. So the question is, as t1 approaches t0, does the average velocity approach something? That's our question. All right. Let us go ahead and do an example now to put this in perspective and give you something more concrete. Let us suppose that our distance function is actually this function. S of t is equal to minus 16t squared plus 29t plus 6. Now, you may wonder where that function comes from. It doesn't matter for this example, but I'll tell you. It's actually, this is the height of a ball which you might throw upward, and uh, this will tell you what that height is after a given amount of time t. Now, it doesn't matter for this problem whether we deal with feet and seconds or some other set of units. The important thing is that we have a distance function, and we want to know, can we find the value of the average velocity at the initial time, say, one half second, if we're dealing with seconds. So can we find that? Well, let's see. We already know that the algebra does not allow us to, but perhaps we can get a sense of what's going on. So let's look at some examples. Let's first of all say, suppose this is the t-axis, the time axis, and here we have 0.5 seconds, or half a second. Let us move a little bit away from that to the right to 0.51 seconds. And also we'll look a little bit to the left at 0.49 seconds. So we're moving a little bit left and right, and we'll compute the average velocity over each of those and see what kind of numbers we get. So in the first case, the average velocity, and this would be over the time interval from 0.5 to 0.51, would be, based on the calculation from the other page, the final distance, which is the distance at 0.51 seconds, minus the initial distance at 0.5 seconds, over the final time, 0.51, minus the initial time, 0.5. Now, if you use your calculator and check this, you get 0.1284 over 0.01, which is approximately 12.84. Now, as I said, the units are not of concern to us. We could think of this as feet per second, if you like, 12.84 feet per second. Let us now take another calculation of average velocity. Let's do it over the time interval from 0.49 to 0.5. That is the time interval to the left of one half second. So that's going to be the distance at 0.5 minus the distance at 0.49 over the 0.5 time minus the 0.49 time. That gives us 0.1316 over 0.01, and that's approximately 13.16 feet per second. Now look what we have here. We have two different values, something we should have expected from different average velocities. But you might notice that they are relatively close to one another. And you can imagine that as we take smaller and smaller time intervals, these numbers might perhaps approach one another. And that number that they might be approaching would be what we call the an instantaneous velocity, the velocity at the instant, t naught, equal 1 half second. That is our goal. So, continuing, can we avoid that whole approximation business? It seems very uh, insecure. So let us look at a visualization of what we just did, which means we'll draw a graph of it, and then see if we can get a better sense of how we might develop a technique here, rather than depend on just approximations. So here is the average velocity as we had originally calculated, the final distance minus the initial distance over the final time minus the initial time. And before I even draw a picture, if we think of this in terms of the distance being a function of time, these would be a difference of the y values of the function, and these difference of, an, of the x values. And this looks like the calculation for a slope, the slope of a line. So let's observe that. Observe that this is the calculation of a slope. Well, that's interesting. That introduces a geometric idea here to what was formerly just an algebraic calculation. So let's look at a picture that might illustrate this.
So let's draw a graph and let me just imagine I have some sort of distance function here. And here is my time t0, say, and my time t1. And follow these up to the curve and over to the left. And there's s0, the initial distance. And then this would be perhaps s1, the final distance. And let me label this point here because we'll be talking about it. This is the point t0, s0. And notice that if I connect these two points here with a line like that, that the slope of that line would be the difference of the y values, s1 minus s0, over the difference of the t values, t1 minus t0. That's exactly the average velocity. So average velocity now has a geometric interpretation. This slope is the geometric interpretation of velocity. Well, that opens a whole variety of possibilities for understanding what's going on. This line, by the way, is given a name, and we will talk about this later, but we'll go ahead and introduce the terminology now. This is called a secant line. It's simply a line between two points on a curve. Now, suppose we want to look at, suppose we imagine, and we want to look at what the velocity would be right at the time t naught. And this point on the curve would represent that. So what if we wanted that velocity? Well, this average velocity doesn't answer that question. But perhaps the velocity, which we might say v i n s t, standing for instantaneous, perhaps, that velocity might be, if you can imagine this point moving here to the left, which corresponds to t1 approaching closer to t0, you see this point moving here. Gradually, you can imagine this point coincides with this point. Well, then this is no longer a line passing through two points. It's a line passing through this one single point. And it seems like the right line there would be a tangent line. Now, we're going to talk about this too later. But at least we've seen the idea emerge naturally here. So this might be, it seems like we could imagine, that this might be the tangent line slope at that point, which is t naught s naught. That seems like a reasonable observation based on this picture. OK. Now let us note that the average velocity, repeating myself, the average velocity does not exist at t0 because there's division by 0 if we were to allow that. So that can't be happening. So this is, and I'll write that down, this is the division by zero problem. So if we want to interpret what we just did as t1 gets close to t0, and we'll note but does not equal t0, because we don't want to have division by zero. We conjecture that the average velocity correspondingly gets close, gets close. In fact, we could say close as we like to the instantaneous velocity, which we wrote as v sub i n s t. That seems to be what we have just learned from the process before. So with that in mind, we go ahead and write a generalization. We generalize. And we will make an informal definition. Now this definition is called informal because there are some technical difficulties that we will put off till a later day. This is sufficient for what we want to do now and I think is very direct. So based on what we've seen now, we're going to generalize. If the values of some function f of x, the function we looked at previously was the average velocity function. Now we're going to generalize to an arbitrary function. The time is replaced by the arbitrary variable x. But the same idea, you'll see it written out the same way, will be involved here. If the values of a function f can be made as close 
to uh, some number L as we like. Now L would be whatever this function is heading toward as we approach this value x. If the values of f of x can be made as close to L as we like by taking values of x, which in our previous example was t, taking those values sufficiently close to a, some number, but not equal to a. So a here is like the t naught from before. Then we have a notation we will introduce here. This will make all of this much easier to talk about because there are a lot of words being used here. And mathematics reduces these words to a nice compact symbolism. Here's what we write. We write LIM standing for limit as x approaches a, that's what the little arrow means, and we will say this more than once so you'll get used to it. The limit of what? Of the functional value. That is what is changing as the x approaches a. We will say that that limit equals some number l and that will be the way we write this. Or we might say also, this is an alternative, that f of x approaches L as x approaches A. Now that way we can say it all in a single line if we're interested in doing that. So this is the fundamental idea we've been talking about. Where this function is going, where the average velocity headed toward, as we let the x approach A or the t approach t naught, in the previous case, that headed toward what we thought was the instantaneous velocity. Here we'll just call it L, some arbitrary number. To illustrate that, let's go to a picture. It's very important in calculus to use pictures as much as possible. The ideas become much clearer and they're easier to remember. So here's a very large picture, I hope, that will illustrate what we just discussed. Let us suppose we have a point down here, A. This is the function f of x. And here is a, so up here on the curve, may or may not be a point of the function. There may be a gap there. It doesn't matter. The limit is not about this point. We'll talk more about that too. Here is the value l. So what we're imagining is that if you have little x values, either to the left or to the right of a, and they approach this number a, then correspondingly, if you follow up to the curve, you can see that there are corresponding points on this vertical axis, f of x, approaching l. So as the x's, each of these approaches a, the f of x's correspondingly approach l. So they're headed toward this point. If you were living along the curve, you might think of this happening as an approach to this point from one side or the other. You can approach from either side. But what we want to think about is approaching, letting x approach a, and then watching to see what f of x is doing. This is what we have described as the limit of f of x here as x approaches a being this number l, whatever that number means. So I will write this down also, because this is something we want to notice, that x approaches a means x can approach a from either side. Now that will become important later because, as you can imagine, if this is a, we could approach from the right-hand side or from the left-hand side, and perhaps that would make a difference. For right now, we won't worry about that. We'll just let ourselves approach from either side. And we will also, in order to make this vertical axis section make sense, we will assume that the f of x is defined for all of the values close to L. So there aren't any gaps. Now, that picture explains what we're doing. Let me make a series of remarks now that you want to keep in mind as we talk about this. We will be spending a lot of time calculating limits. And then we'll later on talk about what they mean for the development of the calculus. But if you keep in mind these ideas, then you'll have a better sense of what those calculations actually mean. So the first thing I want to write down so that you'll see is that limits are about the approach. 
You may remember I started this unit by talking about approach and destination. Limits are all about the approach. On a sketch like the one we just saw, the graph of a function, say f of x, approaches, and I'll bring that graph back in just a moment, approaches the two-dimensional plane location, or we might call that the destination, called the point AL. Now if we look at the previous picture, let me bring this back, here's my previous picture. Here is the point in question, and you can see it has x coordinate A and y coordinate L. So this is the point A comma L. Now that is a location in the plane, and this curve is approaching that from either side, because the x is approaching A and the f of x is approaching L. So on a sketch, the graph approaches the 2D plane location or destination called AL, but the graph itself, the graph itself may have no point in common or have no point, which we can call AF of A, and I'll even put it in quotes because there may not be such a point, may have no point occupying that location. That's what we were saying in this picture here. The limit idea is all about the approach. Whether or not there's actually a point of the function there is irrelevant to the limit. Keep that point in mind and that will help. So let me repeat myself one more time just to get it in a slightly different wording. What happens at the destination is another issue, is a, we could say, separate issue. That is to say, L may not be f of A. In fact, there may not even be an f of A. So we want to keep the idea of the limit separate from the idea of the function. So let me write the notation again and read it. This is the limit. LIN standing for limit, the limit of the function f of x as x approaches a. So notice how I read this, the limit of the function because the function is what is, if you like to think about it, as moving, as approaching. As x approaches a, that limit is equal to L. That is the symbol form of the ideas we've been talking about today. So this function is approaching this number. And this, just to say it one last time, is the language we use in the language of mathematics. This is the language to describe how the outputs, this is a, another piece of terminology that may be useful, how the outputs f of x behave as the inputs which would be x in this case, case, approach a number. That is the fundamental idea that we are discussing here. We will go on and we will talk about some examples, but for now we'll take a pause. Now that we've talked about the fundamental idea of limit, let's look at a few examples before we go any further. So some, some, some limit examples. The first one, we'll look at the limit as x approaches 0 of the following expression, which we will think of as a function, x over the quantity x plus 1 under square root minus 1. And we'll ask ourselves if there is a limit, and since we have no technique at this point, We'll look at a graph and see if we can guess what the limit might be and see if we can make these ideas clear to us.
and also remind ourselves of a little algebra involved here. Now this we will refer to as the function f of x and we examine the graph. When we have technique later we'll be able to answer this question without actually looking at any pictures. But for now pictures are very helpful. First of all, in order to understand this and to graph it correctly, we need to understand what its domain is. So let me take an algebraic moment here and discuss the domain of this function. There are two issues we need to deal with. One is that we have a denominator here and we have to be sure that the denominator is not zero. The second issue is we have a square root. We have to make sure that what is under the square root is not negative. So let's deal with the first issue. We must avoid that that denominator square root of x plus one minus one equals zero. We have to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we just do a little algebra here. Square root of x plus one equals one. Square both sides, get x plus one equal one. That gives me x equals zero. So x equals zero will be a number we want to avoid. The second part of this domain analysis is that we want to make sure that x plus one here is greater than or equal to zero because it cannot be a negative number under the square root. Well, this one's easier. This gives us x greater than or equal to minus one. So if we put these two together, we want the domain to be x greater than or equal to minus one, but x not equal to zero. Okay, with that little algebraic interlude, we can go ahead and graph this function. So let me write it up again here so you'll see it. This is the function x over the square root of x plus one minus one. And we are going to be dealing with the domain x greater than or equal to one and x not equal to zero. Now the graph of this function turns out to be the following. If I mark minus one here, since minus one is the least element that is allowed in this function, if we put minus one in here, we see that we get zero, minus one here, minus one here, that gives us a value of one. And then if we draw the rest of this, I won't go through all the details, we see that we get a function that looks something like this. First of all, note that at x equals zero, which is a point we have eliminated, this function does not exist, is not defined. That's why there's a hole in the graph. Otherwise, the function looks something like this. So this is the function. And you notice there is a hole here, as I mentioned. So if we mark zero here and ask ourselves the question that was asked in the limit. What happens as x approaches zero, and we can approach zero here from either side, what happens to the function? Well, you can see from the picture that functional values are approaching what looks like this position. So our conjecture based on this picture is that the limit of this function the x over square root of x plus one minus one function, as x approaches zero, seems to be two. As the x's here approach zero, it seems to be that the f of x's are approaching this hole, not part of the function, but it seems to be approaching this height of two. And that's all we can say at this point, but that's the idea of limit with this function in mind. Let's look at a second example. In this example, as x approaches zero, we will look at the function sine x over x. And we'll ask the same question, what might this have as a limit? Now this one is different from the other one because our algebraic skills are of no use here. x does not divide into sine x, so there's no algebra to be done here. We can look at this and ask, what happens when x does equal zero? Well, we end up with nonsense. We have sine of zero, which is zero over zero. That is an undefined expression also. So we have a real conundrum here. What could this be, if anything? Well, again, we'll go and look at the graph because those are the only skills we have right now. So if we look at the graph, this is an easy graph to draw. If this is the point one, it's easy to see that there's a hole there, again, because at zero, this doesn't exist. And it is otherwise a nice, interesting sine-like curve, as you might expect with the sine being involved something like that. And if we had to guess based on the picture, it looks again that we could conjecture safely that the limit, if this is our function f of x, 
that the limit of this function as x approaches 0 from either side, either the left or the right, this being 0, it looks like the function is approaching this height of 1. So we look here and we think that the actual limit is 1. Again, that's not a proof, but it certainly is suggestive. Now before I leave you here with some examples to try on your own, let me give you a warning. Not all limits exist. The two limits we just saw, both apparently from the graphs, existed. The first one was 2, and the second one was 1. But not all limits exist. And exist in our context means not all limits are going to be a real number. And we will see many examples of this coming up. So I will pause there so you'll have a chance to try some examples of your own. Now that you've seen some limit examples, we're going to examine the concept of limit a little more closely. The first examples of limits that we've seen have been limits where the x approaches the number a from one side or the other side. Sometimes it's useful to talk about an approach from a single side. So we will be now talking about two-sided and one-sided limits. So let's take a look at what that might mean. First of all, let's recall what we saw before so we can contrast what we're doing now with it. Again, the notation is the limit as x approaches a of the function f of x. And you know, some people like to put some kind of boundaries around the function, either brackets or parentheses. If the function's long and complicated, that's usually a good idea. And what did the x approaches a part mean? It means that if a is the point here, that the x value might approach from the right or might approach from the left. That is to say, when I write x approaches a, I mean that it can approach from either side. But, dot, 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 let's consider an example that will raise questions about that meaning. Let's consider the function absolute value of x over x. Now, this is a classic example. We'll use it for other purposes later, too. It's a very nice example, and it's easy to calculate. Let's see what this would be. If x is a positive number, as you know, the absolute value of a positive number is just x itself. So if x is positive, we have x over x, and that's 1. So the value of this function is 1 if x is greater than 0, that is to say, a positive number. If x is 0, the absolute value of 0 is 0, so we'd have 0 over 0, and that's not defined. So x is the, the function f of x is undefined if ac x actually equals 0. And finally, we have one other case. If x is less than 0, what happens then? Well, the absolute value of a negative number requ requires another negative sign in front of it to become the absolute value, which is always positive. So if x is negative, this becomes negative x over x. And that gives us minus 1. So that's what this function is. Classic function. Here is the picture that corresponds to it. If we mark 1 here on the vertical axis and minus 1 here, then the function has no value above 0 because it's undefined if x equals 0. But to the right of, of 0, where the, function, where the x values are positive, the function is equal to 1. It's always equal to 1. It's horizontal. To the left, it's always equal to minus 1, also horizontal. So we have this very interesting step function, which has no value at the very tip of the two steps. So if we ask the question, what is the limit as x approaches 0, we have some difficulties. We might say, as x approaches 0 from the left-hand side, from the left, if we are approaching 0 here, it looks like the function is heading toward minus 1. 
if x approaches 0 from the left, f of x apparently is approaching minus 1. Likewise, if we say let x approach 0 from the right, then apparently f of x is approaching 1. So what does it mean to say take the limit of this function as x approaches 0, period? Well, that would be approaching 0 from both sides, and that has no meaning. So here's a place where our limit notation has no meaning because the limit from the left and the right are not the same. This was a very easy function and you can imagine how this would occur in other cases. So we have to take this into account. Well first of all we need a better notation than to say x approaches 0 from the left or from the right. That's too wordy. In mathematics we have a shorter symbolism for that. So let me first give you the notation and a couple of warnings about that. Here is the first thing we will translate into notation. x approaches a from the left. How is that translated? It is translated as x approaches a. And what we do is we put a little minus sign up here in the superscript position. Now that's not the only way this is done. This is saying approach a and the minus is supposed to indicate the left side. But we could also say if you're approaching A from the left, you're coming from below. So another notation, which is common in some places, is that we come up to A. So we approach A from below, so we come up to A. I personally like this notation, but this other notation is very common, and you should know both of them. So that's for approaching from the left. What about approaching from the right? Well, you probably can guess if X approaches a from the right this time, then we write x approaches a, and we put a little plus up here because that indicates the rightward direction. Or we might also say that x comes down on a. Again, a very nice simple notation that doesn't involve superscripts, but this one with the superscript is the more familiar one. Now the only warning here is the expected one, beware, that minus a is not the same thing as a with a superscript a minus. And plus a is not the same thing as a with a superscript plus. In fact, let's be clear, this notation will only appear in limits. So usually in context, there's no difficulty about confusing these but you should be aware that these are not the same thing and we'll do examples to show where you'll have a minus and a minus in the superscript position and a plus out front and a plus in the superscript position so you'll be able to keep these straight. So with that notation we can naturally then define what we mean by limits from left and right. We would say that the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left might be some number and this, of course, corresponds to the number line where this is a, and the x is only allowed to approach from the left-hand side. It's not allowed to point, uh, approach from the right-hand side. Likewise, we might let x approach a from the right, and in that case, if a is here, we would let our x's approach a from the right-hand side, but not from the left. In our previous example, we had the function absolute value of x over x. Now that approached 1 as x approached 0 from the right, you may recall, and that approached minus 1 as x approached 0 from the left. So that's an example to show that these two kinds of notations and the idea of approaching left and right are notations that are useful to describe situations that actually occur.
One might ask, what is the relationship between one-sided limits and two-sided limits? Well, this is the most important theorem relating those two. The limit of a function as x approaches a equals some number l, and let me put here to remind you this means two-sided limit. This expression, which we are going to be very interested in calculating, is equivalent to now just for a moment here, let me discuss the equivalence notation. This is a double-headed arrow. It is also sometimes pronounced if and only if. So you'll see that notation, and you'll see these words appearing in your calculus textbooks. The limit of f of x as x approaches a equals some number, a two-sided limit, is the same thing as saying that the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left exists and the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right exists and, I know this is redundant, but it's good to write this down, and both equal L. So this box is equivalent to the previous box. A two-sided limit means both one-sided limits exist and they are equal to the same number. What is useful about this theorem is not moving in the forward direction because if we have two-sided limit we automatically have two one-sided limits. Its value is in moving backwards. If we have a two-sided limit we want to calculate, sometimes it's helpful and the only way to calculate it is to l calculate the two one-sided limits and then see if they are equal to the same number. And if they are, the two-sided limit exists. That turns out to be very useful. Now let's look at some examples. Here is a function, and I'm just going to give you a picture of it. There's no need to write it out exactly. We'll have three numbers on the y-axis, the horizontal axis, and here is the graph of that function. So it is a line segment that's coming up from the left. There's an open hole here, and then a point on the function, and then another open hole here coming down this way. What can we say about the limits involved here? Well, let's just look at the limits as we approach a, of course. Observe that the limit of this function as x approaches a from the left appears to be, well let's see, as x approaches a from the left, we come in from the left, where does the function seem to be heading? Where is it approaching? It is approaching the height of 1. So the limit of this function as x approaches a from the left is 1. Does the function have a value at a? Well, that would be f of a if there is such a value, and in fact there is. At a, there is a dot, so the value of the function is 2. And finally, let's look at the limit of the function as x approaches a from the right. Now as we approach a from the right, the function is headed up here and seems to be headed toward this point, which is the height of 3. Notice that here, the left limit, the right limit, and the value of the function all at the point A are different numbers. So you want to keep that in mind as we look through more examples and some of what's coming up. Having pictures like this in mind to keep the ideas of limit and functional value straight are very, very useful. Let's look at a second picture. Again, we'll have a point A. And again, we'll just use the three numbers 1, 2, and 3 to make our point. So here we have the same function coming up, except now this point is included. There is no other point, of course, since it's a function, there can only be one point above A, and that's it. And otherwise, there's an open hole here going down this way. Now let's examine the limits for this function. If we take the limit of this function as x approaches A from the left, we are approaching A again from the left, as we come up here, the limit is the same as it was before. It seems to be headed toward this point. The fact that there is a value of the function there this time, and there wasn't before, is irrelevant to the limit. The limit is all about the approach. So it apparently is going to 1. Now, in this case, if we evaluate 
the function at a, we ask what is the functional value at a. Instead of being up here at 2, it is now here at 1. So in this case, the left limit and the value of the function happen to agree. But the right-hand limit, as x approaches a from above, turns out just as before, it is coming up here and seems to be going to 3. So in this case, the functional value and the left-hand limit happen to agree, but it's different from the right-hand limit. The moral of these two examples is that the functional value, which is living somewhere on this vertical line for the function, may or may not exist in the first place. And if it does exist, it can exist anywhere on this line. It might coincide with the left limit, as it does here. It might coincide with the right limit. It might be in between, or it might be somewhere else. These ideas of limit and functional value are different ideas. That's the reason the limit idea was introduced. And it is important for calculus that we keep that in mind. All right, let's look at another example that makes that point once again. And here is the picture. Here is the value a, and we'll just have the height 1 marked. Now in this picture, the function value at a does not exist. Because remember, as you look at the vertical line here, there are no points above a, so the functional value does not exist. However, as you can see, the limit of this function, as x approaches a from the left, if you approach from the left, where do you think the function is headed? It seems to be headed toward a height of 1. And if you approach from the right, you are also headed toward the same height of 1. So the limit of the function as you approach a from the left or as you approach a from the right gives you the same height, which is 1. And there is no functional value in this particular picture. Let me look at another example. We could have the same picture with the value a and the height 1, and we might have a functional value up here. This is as I mentioned before. The functional value can live anywhere on this vertical line. In this one, it's actually here at 2. In this one, it didn't exist at all. So in this one, we could say that f of a is equal to 2. And again, as before, the left and the right limit still are equal to 1. So here's a case where the two limits are the same. The functional value doesn't exist here. The functional value does exist here. And you can imagine that I could put the functional value right in that point there. And let me draw the final picture just to show you that. I could actually put it there at a at a height of 1. And in this case, the functional value turns out to be 1, which agrees with the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit. And you see, there's something very nice about this picture, which we will talk about later. Notice there are no gaps in this function. In this function here, previously, there was a hole. The hole was filled by a point, but the point was too far away to do any good. Here, there was a hole and no point to fill it. But this function has no holes. Now, that makes it a very interesting function that we will discuss later. But for now, we'll pause, and you can go ahead and think about what we've just done. Now that we've looked at two-sided, one-sided limits, we have a better sense that there is more to this limit concept than we might have thought at the beginning. Let us look at some other situations that might be a little unusual. Sometimes, when you take a limit, the function doesn't go to a real number. Sometimes it actually continues to grow and grow and grow. It either grows to a very, very large number or to a very, very small number. So we'd like to deal with that circumstance right now. So let's look at limits that fail to exist because fail to exist means not a real number when f of x grows without bound so to make this point let me start out with another classic example this is a function which you no doubt have encountered f of x is 1 over x which is only defined for numbers that are non-zero 
and we will be seeing it again and again in calculus because it has many aspects that we want to discuss. The graph, as you may remember, I hope, is a graph that looks like this. It is undefined at zero, and of course 1 over x can never itself be zero, so there is no value here on the x-axis either. So if this is the graph of this function, we might ask the question, what is the limit of this function 1 over x as x approaches 0 from the left? And notice, I told you we would sometimes use parentheses around the function or brackets. Here is a case in point where it seems reasonable. Now we want to approach 0 from the left. Where is 0? 0 is here. And so we want our x values to come in here from the left. Now, looking at this picture, we ask ourselves, what is the function doing? The functional value, the height of the function, seems to be headed downward. And we know that this is a vertical asymptote for the function, so that this downward heading is going to continue forever. So what we want to write here is that the function is going to be unbounded, going downwards, forever. Well, that's long, and it's also in English. We'd like to have a symbol for doing that. There is such a symbol. We'll use negative to indicate downward. And we'll use this symbol, which is often pronounced infinity, to indicate that we're going downward in a way that the function is unbounded. It is not a good idea to think of this as a real number because it's not a real number. It is simply a symbol that means unbounded going in the negative direction. Likewise, we might say, what is the limit of this function 1 over x as x approaches 0 from the right-hand side this time? If we look at the picture and we let our x's now approach from the right-hand side, what does the function seem to be doing? It seems to be growing without bound. Because this is a vertical asymptote, it will grow and get closer and closer to the y-axis but never reach it. So the height of the function will continue to grow without bound. So we need a notation to say grow without bound but in the positive direction. Well, instead of using negative, you can write positive, but as is traditional for numbers, we often don't write anything at all and just use that to indicate going upward. Again, this is a symbol that indicates unbounded going upward, or unbounded in the positive direction. It is not a real number, and although we will say infinity, and we will say over here minus infinity, do not think of those as numbers. We want to think of these as growing, this is growing without bound. That's the phrasing that is the safest in this environment. All right, what kinds of things can happen then? We've seen this function now as an example of a function where the value uh, x is approaching a number, a real number, and yet the function is either going down forever, or approaching infinity or becoming unbounded below, or growing to infinity in the positive direction, becoming unbounded above. Can this happen to other functions? Of course it can. There are various cases, and these will be, no doubt, outlined in your calculus book, so I will just indicate the basics here. If you take the limit of a function as x approaches a from the left, you can get either minus infinity or infinity. If the function is going down, as we saw before, or going up, you can use either one of these notations. You might also say, in the case of negative infinity, that it is decreasing, or the function decreases without bound. And in the case of the infinity symbol, you might say that it increases without bound. So that's the language you might use. And of course, we might approach from the left. It's also true. It can happen if you approach from the right. It can also happen if you approach from both directions in a two-sided limit. Any one of those can lead to a, an infinity of one kind or the other, going down or going up. So we probably should look at some examples. And let's do that. What kind of things can happen? Well, let's make this very simple. Suppose we have an x value a, and let us imagine that the function is not defined at a. So we can draw this 
vertical dotted line to indicate there's no functional value. What might happen as the function approaches from the right or from the left? Well, in schematic form, we can see that the function might do this on the left and do this on the right. It might go up, which we'd say the limit is approaching plus infinity or infinity. And from the right-hand side, it might be going down, approaching negative infinity or becoming unbounded below. And there are all sorts of variations on this. This went up on the left and down on the right. It might just do exactly the opposite. It might go down on the left and go up on the right. Or, as another example, it might go up on both sides. Or, for example, it might go down on both sides. And you can imagine other variations. It might go down on one side, but the other side might actually approach a value. There's still a problem on the left, but the right-hand side might have an actual functional value. These are all sorts of functions that we will see later. But you should notice from these four pictures that something has happened that we want to take note of. This dotted line that I have drawn seems to be a sort of wall that the function doesn't pass through. It is possible that the function would have a value there, but no matter what's happening on that line, as we approach from the left or from the right, the function is approaching infinity. If that happens, this line becomes important to the function. This line has a name, and you should remember this name from algebra. Here is the definition. A vertical line like the ones we saw in the previous example, and those lines have equations of the form x equal a, that is x equal to a constant. A vertical line is called a vertical asymptote. Always an interesting job to spell that word. It's a, it, it derives from a Greek word, which means asymptote. Uh, vertical line, x equal a, is called a vertical asymptote of the graph of a function which we'll call f for the moment, if f of x approaches either infinity or f of x approaches minus infinity, again, infinity meaning unbounded above, minus infinity meaning unbounded below, if it approaches each one of those as x approaches that number a. And that number a can be approached from the left or the right. So if you approach from the left or the right and your function goes to infinity, some people say blows up, or goes to negative infinity, some people might say blow down. If either of those things happening are happening, then the function is going to have a vertical asymptote at that point A, and x equal A will be the graph of that line. So it's time for you to look at some examples of these. So we'll stop now, and you can try that. Now as we continue with the intuitive beginning of limits, we're going to look at limits at infinity when x grows without bound. If you remember just a moment ago, we looked at when f of x grows without bound. So let's see what happens when the argument, the x value from the domain, grows without bound. So what we'll examine first is our classic example, the example we've looked at very closely before, the well-known function f of x is 1 over x. Now, we want to examine what happens as the x value, which is at the bottom of this function, grows without bound. So to see that most easily, let's draw ourselves a graph. Now, we know what this function looks like. It has a graph that looks something like that. Here's 0 in the center, the x and the y axes. And we want to examine what happens as, first of all, x grows without bound to the right, that would be x going to plus infinity. That's our symbol for growing without bound to the right. And so we are interested in that image. And I'll even write out to the right. 
so that you'll associate this symbol with going to the right. And likewise, we'll want to look at x going to minus infinity. So that's x going as far to the left as possible. And I'll draw it that way. Although you realize, of course, that we write x approaches minus infinity in this form when we write it down in our work. But this is a nice way to illustrate this in the picture. So this would be to the left. And so we want to ask ourselves, what happens to the function as x is either going to the right or going to the left? So we can put that here as a question. What happens to the function f of x? Now remember, f of x is the y value. So keep in mind that that's the vertical dimension. What happens to f of x, comma, as x grows without bound? And that growth, as we just said, could be to the right or to the left. Now we'll come back with this picture in a moment, but let's go ahead and see if we can further discuss this question. We have another way of saying what it is what we're doing. We can ask the question, what is, and this is the piece of terminology, the end behavior the end behavior of f of x. As x goes far to the left, that is to negative infinity, or x goes far to the right, say to positive infinity. Okay, growing without bound in both cases. So here in our particular situation we're asking the question, what is the limit, using the notation we developed last time, what is the limit of 1 over x as x approaches infinity. Now, let's examine once again what this symbolism means. We're letting the x value, which is the domain value of the function, grow without bound, and we're asking the question, which is what this limit is asking, what happens to 1 over x, the functional value? Now, if you look at the picture we just had up here a moment ago, you'll see that as x goes to infinity, the sketch is coming closer and closer to the x-axis. It is dropping lower and lower. That is to say the height of the function is getting lower and lower and therefore heading towards zero. So the limit as, one of, as x approaches infinity of 1 over x is zero. And to be more specific, we could say from above. Because as we saw in the picture, we were coming down on zero. And, if it works that way, it probably works the other way too. As x goes to minus infinity far to the left, 1 over x goes to 0 also, and this time it's from below. And if we look again one more time at the picture, we see that here on the left, the function height is going upward towards 0. So it's approaching 0, a height of 0, from below. So, just to repeat, what we have here is a y value, which is the functional value 1 over x, approaching another y value. This is the height 0. So one might say this is y equals 1 over x approaching y equals 0. y equals 1 over x approaching y equals 0. And of course, y equals 0 is just another way of saying the x-axis. So what we have here is our function, which is 1 over x, is approaching the x-axis. Now these are several ways to see the same thing, but it's important that this symbolism be absolutely clear to you, and that you keep in mind that this object here is a y value approaching another y value. This will come into play very soon as we talk about another notion that you're familiar with, I think. All right. Let's look at the general case where the function may not be 1 over x. But our 1 over x function really does illustrate the general case very well. We want to say that the limit of an arbitrary function as the x value grows without bound to the right, x approaches infinity, equals some number l. And that's also written as f of x approaches l as x approaches infinity. That is the symbolism we use if this function actually approaches a real number. And for the other direction, 
we might write the limit of f of x as x approaches minus infinity equals some number m, say. Alternately written, f of x approaches m as x approaches minus infinity. Now, in our example, the l and the m turned out to be the same. They both turned out to be 0. But in general, if you go to the right or you go to the left, you should expect that there would be different results. Now, with that in mind, we can define something that that previous example really does suggest. Remember, our function 1 over x approached the x-axis. The x-axis is a horizontal line. That suggests the following standard definition. A horizontal line, which we can write as y equals, say, b, where b is a constant, is called, in the right context, a horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptote. And we talked earlier about vertical asymptotes. This is just the corresponding idea for horizontal asymptotes. It's a, called a horizontal asymptote of the graph of a function f if the following happens. If f of x approaches that number b, which is, remember, some real number, and I'm saying that to distinguish the case where we write the infinity symbol, which as you know is not a real number. If f of x approaches b as either one of two things happens. Either x approaches negative infinity is unbounded to the left, or x approaches infinity is unbounded to the right. So if you go far left or far right, and your function approaches a constant, then that constant, written as y equals b, is going to be what we call a horizontal asymptote for the function, just as the x-axis was a horizontal asymptote for the function 1 over x. So with that in mind, let me pose a question to you. Remember, horizontal asymptotes are found by either going far to the right or far to the left. So the question one might ask is how many different horizontal asymptotes can a function have? There is a question for you. And I will pause for a moment and give you a chance to answer it. Now let's see if your answers match mine. Here's what one could do. For example, how many different horizontal asymptotes can a function have? The answer is that since you can only go to the far right or the far left to see if you have a horizontal asymptote, then you can either have none if there's none in both directions, you can have one if you get one in one direction but not the other, or you could have two if you had different ones in the different directions. And we can illustrate those with very, very familiar functions. So I'll write down the answer is 0, 1, or 2. The first illustration I'll use is a well-known function that everybody should be aware of, the f of x equals x squared function, the standard parabola with its nose down at the origin. And if you look, if you go to the far right or the far left, both sides of the parabola go up to infinity, so this has no horizontal asymptotes. This is an example of zero. Then here's another function that we will encounter later in this course again. This is another familiar function, f of x equals e to the x, where e is the, a positive base. And it's a particular base here, but it could be any positive base. And if you notice in this function, if you go to the left, it has a horizontal asymptote, which is the x-axis. If you go to the right, it grows without bound and has no horizontal asymptote. So this is an example of the one case. And finally, this is one of my favorite functions, 
we want one that has two asymptotes. So I'm going to dot in what the asymptotes are. And they happen to occur, this one is at pi over 2, and the one below is at minus pi over 2. The function looks like that. And the actual function is f of x equals tangent inverse of x, which we will also discuss later in this course. But what's nice about this is if you go off to the right, it has a horizontal asymptote of y equal pi over 2. If you go to the left, it has a horizontal asymptote of y equal minus pi over 2. And this is sort of a classic example of two horizontal asymptotes. So I hope you enjoyed doing that problem. We will now pause for a moment and move on soon. And now we continue our examination of limits with more limits that fail to exist. Infinity, which we've already seen, and infinite indecision. And we'll see what that means in just a moment. So let's start by recalling, again, our very, very classical famous limit that we've been looking at, the limit of 1 over x. We will now look at it as x approaches 0 from the right, say. And we know that the limit goes to infinity. And let me draw the picture so that we're clear on what we're talking about here. Here is the 1 over x function again. And as we move toward 0, this is 0 now, and we're moving from the right. That's what the little plus here means, moves, move toward 0 from the right. You can see what the function is doing. It is blowing up. It is going to infinity. It is growing without bound in the positive direction. This is, of course, as we know, one way to so-called fail to exist. Now, we're going to examine other ways, but lest you think that this is the only example of the sort of function that goes to infinity, let me give you a much more familiar one, something you might have seen. f of x equals x cubed. And this is a graph that I hope is familiar. It has a form something like this. And you see, as we go to the right, this function grows without bound. And so this is an example where I would write in symbolism. We have to practice the symbolism. The limit of x cubed as x approaches infinity, that is to say, as we go to the right, is infinity. And that's because the function is growing without bound here. So in both of these cases, we have an example of how a limit can fail to exist. Fail to exist, again, means not a real number. And this is the first case you might see that. But it is not the only case. Let's first look at a few various cases that involve infinities. And then we'll look at a case that doesn't involve infinity at all, and yet is still non-existent. So here's a very simple way to see this. If you have the limit of a function as x approaches infinity equaling infinity, that's like you're going to the right here, and the function is going up without bound. If you have the limit of the function as x approaches minus infinity equaling infinity, that's as though you are moving to the left and growing without bound. Then if you look at the limit of the function as x approaches minus infinity and you get minus infinity, that is, as you move left, you go down. And finally, the last of this quartet, as x approaches infinity, if you get minus infinity, that's the function moving to the right, because the x is moving to the right, and the functional value going down. And see, with this picture, you can very easily see all four of the various cases where both the domain element is approaching infinity and the functional element, the y element, is also approaching one of the infinities. So this is an image you want to keep in mind as you're looking at the various cases for infinity. Now what about that case I promised, which is not infinity? What about the case that I 
called infinite indecision. Well, I like this because this is another classic function that illustrates this very well. And there is actually a technical name here in addition to infinite indecision, which I will tell you about. This is the sine function. Okay, the first of the trig functions you usually learn to examine. And what does its graph look like? Well, you know it doesn't go any higher than 1, and it doesn't go any lower than minus 1. So if that's minus 1 and 1, those are my boundaries for the function. And then it has a curve something like this that goes off in both directions. In this case, both the limit of this function as x approaches minus infinity, that is going to the left, and the limit of this function as x approaches infinity, which is going to the right, both now fail to exist. And you can see that if you think about what's happening here. If you're going to the right, if you're taking this trip with x approaching infinity, what is the functional value doing? It's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down. It is infinitely indecisive. It is never settling on a given number. The same thing happens if you go in the other direction. The function goes up and down, up and down forever. So there is no limit because the function never settles on a single real number. So this fails to exist, and uh, we use the word oscillation. And we say by oscillation to be more technical. That is that the, functional gra the function's graph is oscillating up and down. This is also true of the cosine function. And uh, the sine function and the cosine function share that property. So this is an unusual kind of non-existence. You have now non-existence where limits equal one of the two infinities, which are not real numbers, of course. It indicates growth without bound. And now you have oscillation to add to that which is a non-existence of a totally different kind. So with that, we'll stop and come back and then do some exercises on limits. Now let's do an exercise, an exercise on limits. This is a wonderful example of an exercise that pulls together many things that you've been learning along the way. What we'll do here is sketch a possible graph for a function f with all these properties. So what we'll do here is we'll list a series of properties. In fact, we'll list eight properties. And then what you'll want to do is construct the graph of a function that satisfies all eight properties simultaneously. And we'll see how that goes. So f of 0 is equal to 1. That's one of its properties. The value of the function at 0 is 1. The value of the function at 2 is also 1. If you take the limit of the function as x approaches 2 from below, you get infinity, that is to say it grows without bound. If you take the limit of the function as x approaches 2 from above, it's 0. If you take the limit of the function as x approaches minus 1 from below, you get negative infinity. Remember how this notation reads now. We're approaching the number minus 1, and the superscript minus means from below, which is from the left. Also, if we take the limit of the function as x approaches minus 1 from the right, we get infinity, different limit from the two sides. If we take the limit of the function as x approaches infinity, which we were just examining, we get 2. And then lastly, if we take the limit of the function as x approaches minus infinity, we get infinity. So there you have it.
this is a function that I would like you now to try and graph yourself. And remember, there's more than one way to graph this function. These properties can be fulfilled by several different pictures. So why don't you take a little time to try that, and I'll come back and show you what I did. We're back, and now let's look at the kind of solution that I started to write. And let me bring the problem back so we remember what we're talking about. This was a function. We had eight properties we wanted the graph of this function to have, and we will now go through them one by one, and we'll start by doing what I like to think of as a first draft. In many mathematical problems, it's wise to start with you call it scratch work or first draft of the solution to the problem. And then take that first draft and proceed to create a final graph in this case. So let me show you what I would do as I'm thinking about this problem. First of all, I'm going to draw an axis system so that I have a place to mark things. You may remember the function's value at 0 was 1, so I need to mark a point right there. There's a point that's going to be on the curve. And what else did I have? The very next fact gave me the, the uh, fact that the function's value at 2 was also equal to 1. So I have another dot there. If we continue, the very next fact was, if you look here, the limit of the function as we approach 2 from the left is infinite. So here is 2, and I'm approaching from the left. So in order that I am able to see that, I'm going to draw myself a dotted line vertically, and if I come in from the left, I want my function to do something like this. I may not know the other details, but I know that as I come from the left, this function is going to grow without bound. All right, what was the next one? The next limit was if I came from the right, the function was supposed to be heading towards zero. So whatever the function is doing on this side, it's heading down toward zero, which is a height of zero. Now I'm putting an open hole there because I already know there cannot be a closed hole there because there's already a value of the function above it. So that has to be open. And I know the function approaches this way. What is the next piece of information? The next piece was on the other side of the page. The limit of the function as I approach minus 1 from the left went to minus infinity. So I need to mark minus 1. And since I want to approach from the left and go to minus infinity, let me again here draw a vertical dotted line. And as I come from the left, I know that the function is going to be doing that. It's going to coming down to negative infinity. If you look at the other piece of information we were given, if you're approaching minus 1 from the right, the function is supposed to grow to infinity. So I can put a little arrow there. Then the last two pieces of information said, if I let x go all the way out to infinity, the function should be approaching a height of 2. Well, let's mark a 2 up here. And I can dot this out so I see where the height is. And so the function, as we go further and further out to the right, should be approaching this height of 2. Finally, if, as the function goes further to the left, it should be growing without bound. So I need an arrow to look like that. Now this is the first draft of the graph of the function. And even with this first draft, you can already see where certain things have to happen. If I then proceed to sketch in and connect up the various little arrows here, I can end up with a picture that may look something like this. Now here's my solution. And I put the graph in red so you can distinguish it from all the other marks. Notice that it passes through 1 here, passes through 1 here. In fact, that's the only point of the function on this vertical line. And it goes to infinity here and infinity here. So I just connected these up in the simplest fashion. The function approaches down to 0 here and up to 2 here. And I just connected that with the simple curve. And it goes down to negative infinity here and grows to infinity here. And again, I connected it up with a simple curve. Now, you may find other ways to connect this up. As long as you don't violate those eight conditions, you have a graph that is a solution to this problem. My graph is not the only picture. So with that in mind, I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll come back in a little while.